I'm going to be focusing on engaging with uh, with uh, with my uh, fellow MPs. Uh, we're going to talk about all the challenges we're facing. We're going to talk about how to solve them. Polls are up and down. I mean, I've been. I've been in the game a long time. We need to do more on, on things like housing and, and affordability. And, and part of the, the conversations we will be having in the coming two days are what exactly are, are these things uh, that, w that we will be doing. We always listen to the voice of Canadians and we want to respond to that. I don't focus on the numbers. The Prime Minister arrived at his own caucus retreat a day late today after being grounded in India when the military plane he travels on had technical issues. Now, though, he's on site in London, Ontario, facing a bit of a nervous caucus who spent the summer weathering the blows of slumping public opinion poll support, many of whom were also briefed by those pollsters on those very polls today. Let's bring back the front bench to talk about that. Elliot Hughes, Gary Marr, Anne McGrath, and Rika Walsh. Elliot, I'll start with you. I interviewed uh, David Coletto at Abacus, who had that poll last week that showed kind of one of the wider spreads between the Tories and the uh, and the Liberals, 14 points, on my radio program today. Because he briefed a whole bunch of the BC caucus and a number of other regional caucus. And he said his impression was that nobody was saying, this isn't what I'm hearing at the doors. That, in fact, they were confirming the data he showed them is, is anecdotally what they're experiencing as well. What does that tell you? Well, it, it tells me that the MPs went home this summer and, and got a bit of an earful. Uh, and I suspect that's going to be exactly what they sort of give back to the Prime Minister and his team uh, in London today and tomorrow. But, you know, that's part of, that's part of the game. Um, I think it's also kind of healthy. Uh, they, the, the Liberals haven't really been tested in, in this way, really, over the last eight years in government. And so we're going to really see what they're made of here. I think what's really important for the prime minister and his team to do over the next couple of days is to just listen, is just to allow the MPs to convey what they're feeling, to convey what they're hearing. Because while they may be self-interested in some way that they'd like to keep their job and they're nervous about the polls and so on, but what they're really communicating is what they're hearing from their constituents. And in order for the liberals to turn things around, they need to hear uh, what those voters are saying so they can begin addressing it. So I think while they may be going in uh, in a bit of a tough spot and, and a bit grumpy, I suspect they'll be coming out of the meeting out of London more united, ready to take this on. But look, final point, there's no secret code. There's no cheat code to this. This is going to take hard work and it's going to start with the prime minister on down. But they need to roll up their sleeves, listen to their constituents and their MPs, and figure out a plan on how they're going to get back. Gary, you've been an MLA and a minister at those doors, listening to constituents as well. Uh, take us behind the scenes a little bit, if you could, of what the discussion is like when it gets to the point that members of caucus are actually conveying on the record to the media that things are not going the way they would like them to be. Well, I think it's uh, important for a leader at that point to take a look at uh, whether the leader is listening to the members of his or her caucus. Because if you're not doing that, then that's also, uh, uh, you know, it's an important, critical um, skill that a leader has to, has to take in. And what we've seen in some of the um, media reports uh, in interviews with MPs, some off the record, some off the record, is that the Prime Minister and the PMO are not listening to members of caucus itself. So it's important for MPs to listen to what their constituents have to say. It's equally important for the Prime Minister uh, in his leadership uh, to demonstrate that he has heard these concerns that are being expressed by Canadians uh, through their members of Parliament and, and uh, that he's prepared to respond to it. And, and frankly, uh, just a cabinet shuffle was demonstrated was insufficient uh, to quell some of that, uh, uh, some of that discontent in his own caucus. What do you imagine, Ian, would be sufficient? And just to, to put an, add an anecdote to what Gary said, I, was, I think I told you in the break, I was speaking to a Liberal MP a few nights ago on my drive home who described the cabinet shuffle as having fallen on its face. Like, yeah. that's, that's the point where I had to be like, do you remember I'm a reporter, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now I will say that in all fairness, uh, coming out of a summer break, MPs do tend to be feeling a little bit nervous and a little bit anxious and sometimes a little bit isolated from each other. And so there is a, a lot of angst often coming into the fall session of, of Parliament. 
what's different about this, I think, is number one, how how much they like they, they haven't really been uh, all that open about any discontent in, for the last few years. They've been very remarkably so, yeah. remarkably mm -hmm. so, and now it's like a dam has burst and. Uh, like it, it's not just like a little trickle now it just feels like a little bit like it's hard to imagine that so many people would be saying so many things the other thing that's unusual i think is how di how directed it is um normally i would say that people come back and they what they what they they direct their anger at the senior staff generally speaking not at the leaders so i find that i find that kind of interesting i think that you know this idea, i mean i remember when jean Chrétien referred to his his mp's as nervous nellies <laughs> right so <laughs> you know so so i i think that what's going to be important here is for the prime minister and his team to actually do something about it right to actually like to whether it's having uh, you know having um coffee or lunch or dinner right? like like sort of more social gatherings with groups of them over a period of time but also the thing that they're hearing at the doors i believe is probably it got a lot to do with all, all of the concerns and anxieties that Canadians have around things like housing and cost of living and so forth. And the feeling that the Prime Minister and, and, the, and the, the Liberal government doesn't get it, is out of touch, doesn't understand what people are going through. And so I think that they're going to have to start to demonstrate that. And that's why I think this housing announcement today is so important that it's so important to actually really, you know, it's a housing accelerator fund, accelerate the housing accelerator fund. <laughs> Marika, what is your sense? I mean, you're, uh, I'm just calling people on my drive home. You're actually there. You're in the middle of it. Uh, what is your sense of the, of the mood among MPs? I, I think that is part of it, Vashi, that they don't believe that these attempts at a reset over the summer amounted to very much, if anything at all. I think if we zoom out a little bit, the last time they were all together was at the end of June, where the, the government had had a very rocky first half of the year between foreign interference and, and several other issues, management issues. But they were still seen to be in contention. They were still neck and neck in the polls, despite the fact that the Conservatives had the advantage. And they were talking about the summer as a moment to reset to get tighter, to figure out what their message was, and now we're a few days away from returning to the House of Commons, and instead of that reset happening, and instead of that sort of focus coming, it seems like the opposite, where it's become more pronounced that they don't quite know what their message is to voters, it's become more pronounced that they don't have a clear narrative, and it's become more pronounced that Polyev is benefiting from that. And so I think it's going to be really interesting to see what, if anything, comes out of the end of the meetings yesterday, or tomorrow, excuse me, not yesterday, um, to really see if they do come together on something, because right now that's not clear, and that is what's driving the Liberal MPs anxieties that I'm talking to, is that people on the doorsteps are directly mentioning the Prime Minister when they're talking about their dissatisfaction. It's not the Liberal government, the federal government, it's the Prime Minister in particular. And I think that's what's making this so pointed. David Coletto also told me, Elliot, that basically his data shows that, yes, there are a growing number of Canadians who are comfortable saying that they would vote Conservative. But by and large, the takeaway from the gap he sees between the Tories and the Liberals is that the number of Canadians who say they are dissatisfied or have an anger toward or a malaise toward the current government is what's really grown. So it's like more a dissatisfaction with what they have than an excitement, overwhelming excitement for the alternative. What's the takeaway for the Liberals for that going ahead? The takeaway is Canadians are taking a look at an opposition leader who has come in and they're kicking the tires. That's understandable. It's up to the government, it's up to the Liberal Party to get back to their core beliefs and to get back to convincing Canadians that they're the right party to vote for. This is, again, as I said earlier, there's no secret sauce here. This is just hard work of listening and reacting and coming up with some bold new ideas. One cannot just you know, rest on the laurels and say, well, eight years ago we did this. You need to go and prove to them that tomorrow and the day after and next year is the reason why they're going to vote for you with those policies. The most important commodity in the government is the prime minister's time. Uh, what is he spending his time on? What is he focusing on? It will be fascinating to see, to Anne's point, does he spend a bit more time sort of working and, 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 and sort of putting his arm around the shoulders of his colleagues to kind of start to rally his troops? Where does he spend his time? Is it more housing announcements? That's going to be something to watch, right. I think, over the next couple of weeks. There's a few interesting books from ex-cabinet ministers that talk about that relationship with caucus. Well, you know, Fun reads. Absolutely. I, I absolutely. got to leave it there. I'm sorry, I'm out of time. I, want, I appreciate all your time. Thanks so much to our front bench, Gary Meyer, Elliot Hughes, Anne McGrath, and Marika Walsh.